Hi, in this chapter, I will explain linear momentum and collisions. I will explain inelastic collisions and elastic collisions, and we will talk about center of mass, and we will use conservation of linear momentum. So if you remember, Elon Musk announced Cybertruck in 2019, and it was advertised that the, uh, the windows would not uh, break. But it turned out that the metal ball thrown at the window broke it. So what's the physics behind collisions? Let's learn it today. There's a nice article on Wired you can read up. A physics analysis of Tesla's shattered Cybertruck windows. And if you read the article, you will see that it explains the collisions basically with this formula. And this is momentum equals mass times speed. And we will learn about this equation in this lecture. So the impact of a child bumping into you is low. The impact of a large person bumping into you is high. So the mass is a factor of impact. Also a child can knock you down if they run sufficiently fast enough and jump into your arms. So speed is also a factor for impact. So both mass and speed are relevant when we talk about impact. So now we can define momentum. So when we talk about impact or collisions, then uh, it's not just the mass, not just the speed. So both are important. So we have to define something called momentum. So it will be multiplication of mass and velocity. Momentum is a vector, and that's why we have a vector sign. The direction of momentum is in the same direction as the velocity. Even though rain and hail, here's hail, have the same speed, they have the same speed when they fall from the sky. Um, it has something to do with terminal velocity. Uh, but hail creates more impact, as you can see here, on the uh, glass, it's broken. So hail creates more impact on the umbrella, or you can think about also the umbrella here, or on the cars because hail pieces have more mass than raindrops. So even though the rain and the hail, they have the same speed, but because their mass is different, their momentum is different. So because hail has more mass, it has more momentum, and the impact or the damage, or you can think of like the, the push or the force, that feeling of force, they're all related to momentum. So it's not just velocity, but it's mass times velocity. So this is the, where the impact is coming from. Momentum is, we said mass times speed. So the unit is mass is kilogram, speed is meter per second. So the units of momentum is kilogram meter per second. Momentum is a vector, its direction is the same as the direction of velocity. For example, you can have a momentum vector like this. It's three units in the x direction and four units in the y direction. The magnitude of momentum, it's a scalar. Sometimes we show it without the vector sign, this means magnitude, or we can show it like the, uh, app, uh, the vector between these two bars, it also means the magnitude. And the way that you calculate the magnitude is you calculate it like this. So three squared, four squared, square root. And if you calculate it, it's, it's five in this particular case. Now, the other thing that we will be dealing with in this, in this lecture is the change in momentum. We show change in momentum as delta P, and it will be final momentum minus initial momentum. For example, in, if we have a toy bear like this, and it's falling on the ground, so it has initial velocity V, and it's falling on the ground, and after it falls, of course, it doesn't bounce and its final velocity is zero. 
So if you calculate the final momentum, it will be mass times speed, but speed is zero, minus initial momentum. So initial momentum is mass times again. Now the velocity is for this coordinate system, velocity is in the negative direction. So that's why we write m negative v and it will be mv. So this would be the change in momentum of the bear that falls on the ground and stops. If you want to write the same equation in the vector form, then you would use negative y direction. So you would use the unit vector for y. And the final result will be just like this, mv, but you would also have the direction. So the change in momentum is its magnitude is mv and its direction is in the up direction. For the bouncy ball, now let's think about this one. So it falls on the ground and then it bounces up with the same velocity. So since the velocities are the same, kinetic energy is the same, so there's no change in kinetic energy, but what about the change in momentum? Again, do final momentum minus initial momentum. The final is, so V is in the positive direction, so it's going to be MV. This minus sign is coming from the definition of change, change in momentum. And this minus sign is coming from the fact that the final, the, sorry, the initial velocity is in the negative direction with respect to this coordinate system. So MV minus, minus MV, the final result is, the change in momentum in this case is 2MV. So we will relate the change in momentum to force. Now, F net equals MA, it's something that you're familiar with from the earlier lectures. It was valid for constant M. So if the mass did not change, you could use this. We never talked about the, the, the possibility of mass changing, but now we will, in this lecture, we will talk about it. Um, so in general, mass can change. What are the examples? For example, an ice cube moving and melting at the same time. So as it melts, its mass is going down. If mass is changing, Newton's second law is expressed in terms of change in momentum instead of MA. So how does it work? Remember, so we are gonna write the total force, which means this sigma sign, it means sum all or total. So sum all the forces in the system. So remember we would do free by the diagram. So we would have forces. So sum all, all of them. So find the net force and equate it to before we would do just MA, but in this case, if let's do the most general case, that M mass can also change. So in that case, it will be change in momentum divided by time. Now look at the units. For the force, it was kilogram meter per second squared. Now for this term, this is, this is momentum units. So kilogram meter per second and divided by time, kilogram meter per second squared, which is the same as the unit of the force. So everything checks out. Now change in momentum is, you can also write it as MV. So the net force, so this equation means, if there's net force in the system, it will change the momentum of that object. So that's basically what it means. So in the case that mass is constant, let's assume now this mass is constant. So if it's not changing, it's a constant number, then um, it's, so I can take it out, take outside of this delta. So I can write it as, write it as M times. So what's, what's left inside is just V. So in general, V can change. So, and the change in velocity is, is something that we know already, it's acceleration. So as you can see that if M is constant, this formula, this formula, which is here, it's Newton's second law, it turns into something that we already know, which is F equals MA. 
So it turns out that this is more general. This includes the possibility of change of mass and change of speed. But this only includes the possibility of change of speed, because in this case, the mass is constant. But both are Newton's second law. So we're going to rewrite Newton's second law. So remember from the earlier slide, the net force was equal to change in momentum. So here we are going to, so imagine in general, so you hit some, let's say some uh, ball. Uh, during that, this hitting, what happens is as the time goes on, the force increases. It starts from zero. It's at some point it becomes maximum. And then it goes to zero as when the ball comes out of the bat completely. And in that case, because there's no contact, so the force goes to zero. So the force changes with time. But what we're going to do is we're going to simplify the situation. Instead of this change in profile, we will take, we will assume, we will take the average and we will take that average number as if the force, force is constant. So we will just take the average. So now I'm going to have average here instead of F net. So the, so the average force, if there is some force, it will change the momentum. Now take delta T to this side. So change in momentum, I can rewrite it as this change in momentum, which is by definition final minus initial. It can be written as F average times delta T. Okay, now this thing, I'm gonna call, call this thing a new name. I'm gonna call it impulse. Okay, so impulse is a vector and the force vector and the impulse vector are the same. You can think of the word as roughly, it's like push, you can think of it as push. So when you hit a ball with the bat, you give it an impulse in this direction, okay? So, and it's equal to change in momentum. You can see that the impulse over this term is equal to change in momentum. So what is the unit of impulse then? It's the unit of momentum. So when you hit a ball with the bat, what happens is you create an impulse on the ball. An impulse is basically you are transferring momentum to the ball. Impulse is a vector and it's in the same direction with the force. You can see that from this equation. And let's compare the impulse and the total work. So if you remember from chapter eight, total work would change kinetic energy. So, or you can read it the other way around. If kinetic energy is changing in the system, like uh, the speed of the object is changing, then that means there is some total work. So total work changes kinetic energy, okay? What about impulse? An impulse, if you look at here, it changes momentum. It could be changing the magnitude of the momentum or direction, but the bottom line is total work changes kinetic energy, impulse changes momentum. And remember, work and kinetic energy, they have the same units, units of energy, and momentum or the change of momentum and the impulse, they also have the same units, which is the units of momentum. Let's look at this exercise now. A baseball of mass 0 0.15 kilograms, so this has 0 0.15 kilograms, moves toward, toward the batter, this person, this is the batter here, with speed 40 miles per second. So this is 40 miles per second. This is the speed. When the batter hits the ball, the bat, which is this stick, exerts an average force of 7,000 7, newtons for 1.3 milliseconds. When you hit a ball with this bat, of course, you know, there is some time. 
and it's even less than one second. It's 1.3 milliseconds. It's almost 1,000 of a second. The question is, what happens to the final speed of the ball or the final velocity of the ball? So the ball is coming with 40 and then you hit it and the ball, maybe it's going to slow down and continue going to the left or maybe it's going to go to the right. So we will calculate it. We will use this equation that we learned in the previous slide. Impulse is the same, impulse is in the same direction with force. Here, force is in the positive direction. So you hit the ball this way. So the force is in the positive direction. So the impulse is also in the positive direction. That's important because uh, that determines which, or if you're gonna use positive or negative for momentum forces and other things in the equations. So the coordinate system, we, let's choose the coordinate system. I will choose this to the right as positive. So now I'm going to write down the force, which is 7,000. Why do I use positive sign? Because the force is to the right and I am using this coordinate system. And I'm going to multiply it by the time. So the time is 1.3. Of course, I have to convert it to seconds. And if you multiply these numbers, what you find is 9.1 Newton times second. This is the same as kilogram meter per second, which is, so it's like M times V. So this is also units of momentum. Okay, so this is the impact. So this is the impulse. Now, so we calculated this part, which is 9.1 Newton second. Okay, now we can relate it to this part by using again this formula and find the final momenta or the final uh, velocity. So let's write down this part. So the final momentum minus initial momentum, I can write it as mv final minus mv initial. It will be equal to, to this number because it is equal to impulse. So impulse 9.1 equals mass is 0 0.15 kilogram, it's given in the problem, times V final minus, again, mass 0 0.15 times V initial. Now look at V initial. The ball is moving to the left initially. So V initial is 40, but its sign is, it comes with negative sign. Because remember, these are vectors. In fact, we can also put vector signs here and here. So we have to use minus 40. These signs are really, really important because they will affect the result. So you have to be careful about them. This minus sign is coming from this. It's part of the formula, or the definition. But this minus sign is coming from the fact that with respect to this coordinate system, the initial velocity is to the left in the negative direction. And if you make this calculation, you find positive 20.7 meter per second. So that means the ball, the baseball, it moves in now in the positive direction. So, so it's moving to the right with final speed 20.7 meter per second. So this is a typical question of collisions. So it's 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 a, so there's a bat and it gives the baseball some impulse which ultimately changes its velocity, its direction, and also the magnitude. So if you make an experiment where let's say you have a piece of towel or let's say a pillow. A soft pillow like this and if you if you have an egg if you drop it would it break think about it you can make that experiment if you want or you can drop the egg on your bed it will not break it's not going to break but what happens if you if you drop the 
the same egg on the table. What happens? It breaks, right? So why does that happen? What, why is the egg, why does the egg break in, in the second situation, but not in the first situation? Or we can make the same experiment with this setup. So we have this sheet and you can throw the egg to the sheet and you will see that it will not break. So we can use a wall or a sheet to stop an egg of mass M and speed V. In both cases, so either you are throwing the egg to the sheet or to the wall. In both cases, the impulse on the egg change in momentum is the same. So in both cases, the, the change in momentum of the egg will be the same. Why? Because the final momentum will be zero because it's stopping. And the initial momentum will be whatever that initial momentum is. So whatever, you know, it depends on the mass and the initial velocity. So zero minus this term will be negative mv initial momentum. So this will be the change in momentum of the egg. Negative impulse on the egg means egg's momentum has been reduced. The egg slowed down and stopped. Impulse is also equal to, we can write an impulse as also we can write this part as well. By definition, it's force times delta t. So the wall stops the egg quickly, right? When you throw the egg to the wall, what happens? The wall applies some force on the egg so that eggs speed goes down to zero. So the wall, by using the force, the normal force, stops the egg, right? But it does it really quickly. So for a given impulse, let's say this impulse is given, the change in momentum is given, but this may change. So the wall makes it really, really quickly. So this is for, in the case of wall, this is really small number. That means for a fixed impulse, Remember, this was fixed. It depended on the moment, uh, mass of the egg and initial velocity. If the time is less than the force, that means the force is large, which breaks the egg. So the reason, so let's think about the sheet. The sheet stops the, eggs, the egg slowly. So the sheet actually takes, you know, it, it exerts force on the egg to stop it but it stops the egg at, at a larger time. So this time is more. If you have more time for a given impulse, for a given change of momentum, you need less force. So for a given impulse, there's large delta T and small f, which doesn't break the egg. So the reason that the pillow or the sheet doesn't break the egg, even though both the sheet and the wall, they, the change in momentum of the egg is the same, even though this is the same, but this part is different. For the sheet, it takes more time to stop the egg, so this is more, and force is less, so less force doesn't break the egg. But in the case of wall, it stops the egg really, really in a short time, so this is less, and the force is more. And when you apply large force on the egg, it actually breaks the egg. So that's the reason between the two situations. If there's an external force, F, such as a bat hitting the ball, the momentum will change. We learned about this, right? So, so the change in momentum, it's related to the force that the bat applies on the ball. So that average force, we said, you know, the force changes with time initially, it starts from zero, it increases and then goes to zero. But let's think about it, it treat it as a constant and call it average force. And change in momentum is basically that average force times the time, delta T, that the force, uh, that the, the bat and the baseball are in contact. So, but what about if the force is zero? Now, 
if you make this side of the equation zero, so what you get is, so if this thing is zero, because if in the case that f average is zero, let's say there's no bat, the ball is, let's say, moving in this direction with some momentum, and nobody is hitting it, so this is zero. So I'm going to equate it to zero. See what happens. Then I can rewrite this equation as P final equals P initial. So that means momentum conservation, right? Initial momentum and final momentum, they're not changing because the change is now zero. So that would correspond to momentum conservation. And there's a warning, momentum is conserved. So how did I find this equation? I found it by giving F, so F average zero. So I said when this is zero, so this whole term is zero. So P final minus P initial is zero, then you get moment, momentum conservation. What about this case? That you're hitting the, uh, hitting the baseball with a bat? Well, in this case, if average is not zero, then this term is not zero, which is P final minus P initial. So since this term is not zero, because this is not zero, then we cannot talk about momentum conservation. And it makes sense, momentum is not conserved here. It should change because there is some impact that's given from the bat to the ball, which changes its momentum. Okay, but if we have zero force, then the momentum is conserved. So we have this equation. So in this case, we have only the only one ball, but we will do collisions in the next slide. So we can have multiple uh, objects, which you know colliding with uh, each other. So in that case, the initial momentum is not just for one object, but it will be for multiple objects. And the final momentum will be also for multiple objects. Again, the sigma, it means, it means sum. Sum all the final momentum, which is like this. And this is summation of all the initial momentum. Here's an exercise. Let's say we have two canoes and this person is pushing the other canoe for uh, 46 with 46 newtons of force for 1.2 seconds. Find the final momenta of both canoe. Here's the solution. We are going to use the impulse equation. Person giving impact on ca canoe two. So this person is pushing canoe two. What is the impact that's given by this person on canoe two? Now we're going to calculate it. So it will be, so this person is pushing canoe two with 46 newtons. So it will be 46, the force is 46. And how long? 1.2 seconds. So delta T is 1.2. And if you multiply these, you will find 55 newton second. And we know from the formula that this impact is also equal to change in momentum. And this will be a change in momentum of canoe two. And change in momentum is by definition final momentum of canoe two minus initial momentum of canoe two. Initial momentum is zero. Why? Because the canoe two was stationary initially, because it says both canoes are initially at rest. And final is final. Let's write it that way. So from here, what we find if we equate these we find final momentum of canoe two is positive 55 kilogram meter per second. So that means the canoe two goes in the positive direction, which is to the right with respect to this coordinate system, which makes sense. Now, what about the canoe two now? This canoe two giving impact on person, this person. How does it happen? Well, if there's this person is pushing the canoe to the right, then the canoe is pushing this person's hand to the left, right? And it's this force. And from action reaction, Newton's third law of motion, if this person pushes the canoe with 46, 
then the kernel kernel two pushes this person this person with the same force in the opposite direction which would be again for the six newtons so let's now calculate the impact given by kernel two on the person it will be the force times delta t now the difference here is the force is now negative four to six it's in the negative direction time is again 1.2 from the, from the problem and we find negative 55 newton second and in fact we did the we found the same impact except it's in the negative direction now and again if you equate it to p canoe one final minus p canoe one initial you will find the first canoe will have the, imp uh, the final momentum in the negative direction which uh, with the magnitude 55 kilogram meter per second so that makes sense both initially both were stationary and final in the final situation they have the same momentum in the up the same momentum in the opposite directions so this has p final one has 55 and p final for the second canoe it has also 55 but they are in the opposite direction now is momentum conserved here let's see this is our momentum conservation equation for two objects we have canoe one and a canoe two initially they were at rest so zero zero initial momentums are zero the final momentums are negative 55 and positive 55 so from here we can verify that the momentum is conserved so momentum conservation for uh, of both canoes together is satisfied so the total momentum initially was zero now if you look at the total momentum finally even though individually these have canoe one and canoe two they have some momentum in the opposite directions but when you sum them up and you remember these are vectors when you sum them up it gives you zero which is equal to initial momentum so momentum is conserved and we verify it now the last thing that i can uh, i uh, want to say here is the final speeds don't have to be the same now if this is momentum it means m times so m2 times v2 and here this is m1 times v final this is for the first one and this is for the second one now since the m's are different you can see m's are different even though the momenta are the same because m's are different the velocities will be different so m2 m2 is 250 so this one is heavier second canoe so it's its velocity its speed will be smaller than the speed of canoe one so the speeds are different but the final momenta they are the same and they're in the opposite directions Here's another exercise. A honeybee of mass 0.15 grams starts from rest and runs towards the other end of the 4.74 gram, 75 gram stick with speed VB. So the bee is moving this way. Due to momentum conservation, the stick starts to move in the opposite direction. As you can see, it's shown here. So the bee is moving to the right and the stick is moving to the left. And that speed, the speed of the stick is 0 0.12 centimeter per second. The question is, what is the velocity of the bee? So the, as the honeybee starts to move, so it, it was initially at rest and then it starts to move, and the stick also starts to move, we can say the momentum of the honeybee and the stick individually are changing. So the momentum, because the speeds are changing, they were at rest initially and then started the motion. So the momentum 
of each object here is changing, but the momentum of both the honeybee, so the total momentum of the honeybee and the stick together is conserved because there's no external force on the bee stick system. And by the way, we ignore water resistance here. So remember, the external force, we're talking about average force times delta T, it will be equal to change in momentum, which is P final minus P initial. And these are vectors. In this case, in this system, there's really no external force. Nobody is uh, pushing the B. So this is zero. Then from here, we find the momentum conservation, which is P final. P final equals P initial. And let's put the summation signs as well, because we have two objects, the honeybee and the stick. So we are going to use the momentum conservation here. So what are the momenta initially for the, for the honeybee and the stick? Well, they're zero, right? They were, they start from rest initially, the speeds were zero. What about the final? So the fi in the final case, the B has the mass and the velocity, and the stick is moving in the negative direction with respect to this coordinate system. So to the right is positive, to the left is negative. So the momentum of the stick comes with the negative sign. So M stick times V stick. Now, if you solve for the speed of the B, it becomes M stick V stick divided by M B. And if you plug in the numbers, you will find the speed of the B is 3.8 centimeter per second. Now in this problem, you don't have to convert things into kilogram or this speed into meter per second. It works so you can use these as is, like gram and centimeter per second. That's okay because we are not really using a formula, we have an equation. So we are not really calculating energy or force or anything like that. So we just have an equation. So if you use, for example, for masses, if you use grams, those grams will be will cancel for from each term. If you use kilograms, those kilograms will cancel. So whichever units you use, because this is an equation, there's an equality, those units will cancel. So as long as you're consistent, like using grams for all the masses or kilograms for all the masses, or using centimeter per second for all the speeds or meter per second for all of them. So as long as you're consistent, you can use any units when you are dealing with equations, not formulas. Now let's move to recoil. Probably you have seen and maybe even experienced this. If you fire a rifle, it will actually recoil. So after it fires, it will go back a little bit in the opposite direction to the bullet. So it will like, you will feel that going back in the rifle. And that happens because of the momentum conservation. So now we have the system of the rifle and the bullet. We will apply the momentum conservation. So initially, the momentum of the rifle and the bullet are zero because they are stationary. Now if you fire the rifle, what happens is the bullet goes forward. So the bullet has some positive momentum and the rifle Let's, say, let's write the rifle's momentum. We don't, so we don't have to write negative here. We are going to find actually to be negative. So let's say we, we don't know initially. Now the equation will actually tell us. Now, if you put this term to the other side, you can see that it goes with the negative sign to the other side of the equation. So the momentum of the rifle, negative momentum of the rifle equals momentum of the bullet and if you write them as mv terms you end up with this equation 
You can also put the uh, negative sign on the other side if you want. You can also write it like we are final equals. You can put the negative sign here as well by multiplying uh, both sides of the equation by a negative one. So, but these are equivalent. What this equation tells you is the rifle's velocity will be given by this equation and it will be in the opposite direction. You can see the negative sign. That's the meaning of it. It tells you that the rifle's velocity, the recoil velocity, will be in the opposite direction to the bullet. So if the bullet is going to the right, the rifle will recoil to the back. Okay, here's an exercise. A rifle shoots a four gram, four gram of bullet at a speed of 900 meter per second. The mass of the rifle is three kilogram. What is the recoil speed? So basically we will start with the momentum conservation. So let's write the summation sign initial momentum of both objects, the rifle and the bullet, will be equal to final momentum of the both objects. So P bullet initial plus P rifle initial equals P bullet final plus P rifle final. So because initially they had both uh, the rifle and the bullet, they were at rest. So initial speeds are zero. That means initial momenta are zero. What about the final ones? So the bullet is four grams. Uh, you can convert it to kilograms. So the thing here is there is, this is given in grams and this is given in kilograms. So I have to be consistent. Remember, this is an equation. I can use any units as long as I am consistent. So I have to convert either this one to grams or this one to kilograms. I choose to convert this one to kilograms. Either way, you can do either way. So if you convert it to kilograms, it, may, it becomes four times 10 to the negative three. And the mass, uh, sorry, the speed is 900. 900. And I assume the bullet goes this way. VB, so that's why I'm using positive sign. And now um, the mass of the rifle is three kilograms. See, everything is now in kilogram. And I don't know the, the final speed of the rifle. Now that's what I'm gonna calculate. Now, if you do the calculation, so multiply these and put these on the other side. It, it, so you get a negative sign. If you do the calculation, you find, or just let's write the magnitude. So minus 1.2 meter per second. That means the rifle will go in the negative direction, which is this direction. And its recoil speed will be 1.2 meter per second. Of course, it's small if you compare it with the speed of the bullet. It's almost 900 times smaller. And that makes sense because there's almost a thousand, factor of thousand between the mass of the bullet and the mass of the rifle. Now, we can use momentum conservation for things that break into pieces. So it doesn't have to be two things moving with respect to, together, with respect to each, other, each other, but it could be like one object you have initially, like this one. So there is M2 and M1, and there is some spring between them. And they're tied with some string. And what happens is you, you cut the string, and then because of the spring force, they go in opposite directions with certain speeds. 
certain final speeds. You can use momentum conservation in this case as well. We will again do initial momentum equals final momentum. Initially, both are at rest, so the speeds are zero. V2 initially is zero, V1 initially is zero. If speeds are zero, momenta are also zero. Why? Because momentum is mass times speed. What about the final case? Finally, let's say this one has M1, V1, and this one has M2, negative V2, because it's in the negative direction. And if you put this term on the other side, you'll find M2, V2 equals M1, V1. And from here, you can also calculate the ratio of V1 divided by V2, and it will be M2 divided by M1. So if the mass, so this tells you, if mass of the object is large, then its velocity will be smaller with respect to the other one. The momenta of both will be the same, but because the momentum is mv, so momentum for both is the same, but velocities, they depend on the masses, right? If the object is more massive, let's say if mass is large, then the, the speed of that object will be smaller with respect to the other one. In this exercise, we have two people, Amy, 150 pounds, and Wen, 50 pounds. They're standing on slippery ice and push off each other. If Amy slides at six meter per second, what speed does Wen have? So we are using, again, the momentum conservation. Initially, they have zero momenta because initially they have zero speeds. And finally, Amy will have its mass and moment, uh, speed. So this is the final momenta of Amy. And this is the final momenta, momentum of Wen. So mass of Amy is 150. The speed of Amy, final speed is six. It's given here. But since she is moving in the negative direction, so we have to add negative number here. The mass of when is 50 and we don't know what speed she has finally. So that's what we're gonna solve for. And if you solve for this equation for uh, V uh, when, you will find 18 meter per second. It will be uh, the final speed of when. So again, you don't, if you have an equation you can use any units. In this case, we did not use SI units, which is kilograms, but we used pounds. Let's move to inelastic collisions. So there are two types of collisions. One of them is inelastic. The other one is elastic. We will start with inelastic ones. So they are the collisions where energy is lost into heat, sound, or light. So energy is not conserved, but momentum is conserved. So two objects are colliding and they are, after the collision, they go, let's say, in the opposite directions. They can go in the same direction as well, depends on the situation. But some heat or light or sound is produced in this process, so the energy is not conserved. Even though energy is not conserved, momentum is conserved, so we can have this equation. And even though kinetic energy is not conserved, we can still write the initial kinetic energy and final kinetic energy, and we can calculate the difference. And that difference will give us the amount of energy that's lost in this collision. So we have a subset of initial uh, collisions, which is called completely inelastic collisions. In that case, objects stick together during the collision and they don't bounce. 
Here we have some bouncing. So they come in and then they co come out. So there's some bouncing. But in the case of these trains, what happens is initially this is stationary and the train M2 hits the train M1 and then they stick together. They get connected. And after that point, they move together. These are called the special case of inelastic collisions. They are called completely inelastic collisions. So in that case, if you write the initial momentum, so this has some momentum, V0, M2, M2, V0. This has initially no momentum because zero speed. And finally, I don't write two terms. I can just write one term. Well, if you want, if you distribute it, it becomes two terms, but you can just write it as one term because the final velocity for M2 and M1, it's the same thing. And if it's the same thing, I can write it like, like this one. And this is an exercise to completely inelastic collision. In this case, there are two pl uh, players, they collide and stick together. So they will collide, they're coming with these velocities and they have these masses, they will collide and stick together. The first part of the question is what is their velocity immediately after the collision? We will use momentum conservation. They have their masses. This has positive speed, positive velocity, you can see here. The velocity of this one is in the opposite direction, so it comes with negative sign. Since they will stick together, so they will be like one object with mass 95 plus 111. So you can write them as like this. And since they stick together, they will move with the same final velocity. And if you calculate this velocity, so a priori, we don't know after they collide if they're gonna move to the right or to the left. Now this, this final result, it actually tells us that they will move together after the collision to the left with this speed. And if you, it makes sense because if you look at the initial momenta, this has less mass, less speed, and the blue player, it has more speed and more mass. So the blue player has more momentum. So the final speed or the final total momenta, momentum, it's in the, in the negative direction, which makes sense. The second part of the question is, what are their initial and final total kinetic energies? Uh, so if you write the initial kinetic energy, so it will be the kinetic energy for the first player. So it's mass and it's initial speed squared. Remember the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And this part is the initial kinetic energy for the, first play, uh, the, for, uh, the second player. This is the mass. 111 and this is the speed so 4.1 squared so this gives me the initial total kinetic energy of both players which is 1601 joules and what about the final well final i can calculate it like this if you want you can calculate it separately uh like uh one point uh, one half 95 0 0.48 squared plus one half 111 times 0 0.48 squared that will give you the same thing but you can you can calculate it this way as well because finally after they stick together they have one common speed and this 0 0.48 remember we found it here it was the final speed of both players after they stick together and if you calculate so the the, the kinetic energy final is 23.7 joules. And the difference, it tells you how much energy is lost during the collision. So the total kinetic energy is decreased, and this is what happens in inelastic collisions. So what happened to that energy? Well, that energy, some of it went into, so when these two players, they collided, some of it went into sound. 
and some of it went into the vibrations in the body. So when they hit together, hit each other, collide with each other, they created some vibrations in their bodies and those vibrations went into heat in the body and finally that energy is lost. Okay, now in this case, we have two boxes. Again, collision. It's just like the players, but in this case, the second bo box, it has initial, zero initial speed. So, but we are using the same equation. So this box comes in and hits the second box. Initially, this has the speed of 10 meter per second. What happens the final, what is the final speed after the collision? So what is the initial momentum? This has no momentum. This has momentum 10 times M. This is the momentum. And what is the final momentum? Now they stick together. It says in the problem, they stick together and move together with the common speed V final. So I'm gonna write it like this. If you, if you want, you can write it as separately like this V final, but it's the same thing, V final. So you have two M here. If you cancel M's, so V final becomes just five. Now what's interesting here is, it's a special situation where you have identical, so two objects with the same mass, they don't have to be identical, but their masses are identical. What happens if you have, if they stick together, the final velocity becomes just half of the initial velocity of the, of the block that was moving. So it's just a special case. Of course, if the masses were different, then you wouldn't find five, but it will be some different number. Here we have another example for inelastic collisions. This is called ballistic pendulum. In this case, we have, a, we have a wooden box here and it's hang like this, it's a pendulum. So it, it can swing back and forth. So initially it's at rest and there is a bullet with lowercase m. Its mass is lowercase m and it comes with some initial speed. And it hits the bullet it goes into the bullet. So the bullet and the wooden box, wooden block, they become one single object. So it, you, you, can, you can see that it's an inelastic collision. They stick together. So this part of the equation of the, uh, of the collision is inelastic collision. Remember in inelastic collisions, even though energy is not conserved, but momentum is conserved, so we can write the momentum conservation equation. Initially, what is the total momentum of the system? Well, only the bullet has momentum. So we are gonna write M times, which is the bullet mass, times the bullet initial velocity. And finally, because they stick together, we are going to use the total mass and they have the common velocity, let's call it V final. So if you solve for V final, it becomes M V zero divided by uppercase M plus lowercase M. Now let's move to the second part of the problem. In the second part, what happens is because of that impact that's coming from the bullet, this pendulum swings up and stops at this point momentarily. Of course, it goes back down. The question here is what is this, what is this height? So how high can it go with the impact that's coming from the bullet? Now, in this part of the problem, there's no collision. The collision happened in the first part. Here, it's just going up. So it starts with some initial kinetic energy. The question is how high can it go? In this part of the problem, we have to use the notion that the mechanical energy, which is kinetic plus potential energy is conserved. So, and we will use this to find the height. So initial kinetic energy plus 
initial potential energy. This goes back to chapter eight. It will be equal to final kinetic energy plus final potential energy. Initial kinetic energy of the system is, so they're moving together. So I can write one half M, uppercase M plus lowercase M times they have this common speed V final. And here, let me choose this point. Let me put my coordinate system at this point, x, y. So in this case, at this, at this level, potential becomes zero. Remember, potential energy is u equals m g. In this case, well, let's write it this way, u equals g y. But here at this level, y is zero. So the potential energy will be zero. At the top, it will stop momentarily, so the kinetic energy will be zero. And the potential energy will be, by using this formula, lowercase m, uppercase m, g, h. Now these two terms, they cancel. And we can solve for h here, so it will be 1 half v final squared divided by g. And now take this v final from the earlier calculation and plug it into here. And the final result is this. So this height, how high this goes up, it depends on g, the masses of the wooden block and the bullet, and also the initial speed of the bullet. For collisions in two dimensions, conservation of momentum is applied separately for each axis. Before we did collisions in one dimension, so we had one momentum conservation equation. Now we have two, but the only difference between them is this one is written for the x-axis. Remember, momentum is a vector, so it can be analyzed in we can find its components as the x component and y component. So the x component of momentum is conserved and this says the y component of the momentum is conserved. When do we use these equations? Well, we, use, we can use them in collisions in two dimensions. For example, in this case, there is this car that's going in the positive x-axis with speed 16 meter per second and the second car it moves in the positive y direction with speed 21 meter per second so when they collide they will stick together and they will move in some direction which is this way so that will be the final momentum but we can analyze this system in terms of the x Momentum in the x direction is conserved and momentum in the y direction is conserved. So we would use this initial momentum and the, initial, the final momentum. Of course, you have to multiply this by m to find momentum. So, to find, so for x, we will use this one, this momentum component. And so if this is p final, we would use p, p x final for this one. And for the second equation, we would use this momentum as the initial and this component P Y final as the final momentum in the Y direction. Let's talk about elastic collisions now. So in elastic collisions, energy is conserved. So there's no energy lost into heat, sound or light. And momentum is also conserved in any kind of collision. So momentum is conserved both in elastic and inelastic. For momentum conservation, we have this equation that we are already familiar with from the earlier slides. And for energy conservation, now we have this equality. We didn't have, we didn't have this equality in the previous slides where we dealt with 
in elastic collisions, but here in elastic collisions, we have also the initial energy is equal to final energy. Of course, if you have two objects, you usually have another term here, another term here. But in this case, we have uh, initially just this has energy and momentum. This doesn't have anything. So that's why initially we only wrote one term, which is for this one. So what's happening here? This object, so initially this has no speed, so it doesn't have no momentum. So let's say P equals zero and kinetic energy equals zero. So initially only this one has kinetic energy and momentum. So its momentum is this, its kinetic energy is this. And finally, when the collision happens, this, because this has, this is massive, it still continues to go in the right direction. It doesn't bounce back. And this, now, it also gives this some impact, which makes M2 to gain some momentum. So it also moves in the positive direction. So that's why both terms are positive. And these are the kinetic energy terms for each one for the final case. We can talk about these three special cases in elastic collisions. The first one is if the masses are the same. So you have MM, and this comes with V0. It's interesting. What happens is after the collision, now this stops, and the second one, which was initially had zero velocity, now it moves with speed V0. This actually happens when you play pool or billiard. If the billiard ball hits the other billiard ball just in the middle, exactly in the middle, and because they have the same mass, the one that had initial speed, it stops and the other one starts moving. But this happens only when the masses of the two objects are the same. Okay, here's the second situation. If M1 is very, very small, then M2. That also means, so this is too small. Let's say this is one gram. And let's say this is uh, 1,000 kilograms, one ton. It's a huge difference, right? So what happens is a really, really small object hits a really, really, uh, sorry, really, really light object. This is really, really heavy object, what happens? It comes with this speed, this has, and the M2 has zero speed, and it will bounce back approximately with the same speed and it will go in the opposite direction. So because this is too heavy with respect to this one, this will act almost like a wall. So it will not really move at all. Well, if it will move real, really uh, small, uh, maybe distance, or so maybe gain really, really small speed, but it it's almost zero in this limit. So this, you know, if m1 divided by m2, if this goes to almost zero, just like in this case. Remember, we said M1 is too small than M2, so this limit would go to, when at the limit that this ratio goes to zero, then the final velocity of this one will be zero. I'm talking about the limit now. And the final speed of this one would be the initial speed, but completely in the opposite direction. So it's almost like a ball hitting the wall and bouncing back with the same speed. Now here's the third situation. In this case, M1 is really heavy, let's say 1,000 kilogram, and M2 is really light, one gram. Now in the limit of, in this case, M2, one divided by one gram divided by 1,000 kilogram, in the limit that this, this ratio goes to zero, what happens is the final speed of this one doesn't really change. 
and the final speed of this one, the, heavy, uh, the light one, it becomes 2v0. So if you use these equations, the momentum conservation and energy conservation, and whenever you see these, num these ratios in your calculations, if you set them to zero, or in this case, this M1 divided by M2, and you would find these final speeds. Now, let's talk about elastic collisions in two dimensions. We said in, if you have two dimensional collisions, elastic or inelastic, you will have momentum conservation for each axis. But in elastic collisions, in addition uh, to these momentum conservations, you will also have kinetic energy conservation. So in this problem, this in this game, this, this object slides and comes and hits the green one. So green one is initially at rest. This has the speed 1.5 meter per second. And finally, it, they go in, because it's not head-on collision, you know, uh, this uh, yellow one hits the side of the green one. So the yellow one goes with angle 66 degrees in this direction. And the green one will come out with that angle, with the horizontal, which is shown as theta here. We will calculate what that angle is and what the final speed of the green object after the collision. So in the first part, let's find um, the final speed of the second object. We, we can use energy conservation. So the initial energy is one half. The mass of this object, it's, uh, these objects are seven kilograms. So seven, so both are seven kilograms. So initial speed is 1.5 squared. The second one has no kinetic energy because it has no speed. And the final kinetic energy is I will use these, these velocities. Of course, I don't know the velocity of the green one, so I will just use the variable. And if you solve this equation, you will find the green one is coming out with velocity 1.37 meter per second. Now in the second part, let's find this, find this angle theta. For that, we have to use not kinetic energy, but the momentum conservation. So you can use either the momentum conservation in X or momentum conservation in Y. In this case, What's useful is the momentum conservation in Y because we know initially, initially the momentum in the Y direction is zero. If you want, you can also use the, this one too, but I'm gonna use the second one. So initially there's no momentum in the Y direction, right? Even though the first object, the, uh, the yellow one, the yellow object, it has some momentum, but it's purely in the X direction. So initially objects are not moving in the y direction, right? So that's why we have zero for both objects initially. What about final? Finally, this has the momentum. So if you calculate this component, so it's going to be sine 66, and this is the velocity, and this is the mass. So P is mass, which is seven times velocity, 0 0.61. And to calculate this, I have to multiply P by sine 66 degrees. So that's what I have here. Now this is the momentum for the first one. What about the second object? The, the Y component of its momentum is again mass times now the speed we calculated in the previous step, which is here, times sine theta, it will give me this 
this component, but it has to come with negative sign because this direction, this direction is negative direction. Now from here, what I find is sine theta equals 0 0.4. And if you take the inverse of both sides, so I will find sine inverse 0 0.4 is equal to 24 degrees. As you can see in the first part, I used energy conservation and in the second part, I used momentum conservation. You can use either one depending on the problem. So here's a summary table for collisions. If it's an elastic collision, everything is basically conserved. So momentum is conserved and kinetic energy is conserved. If it's inelastic collisions, then only momentum is conserved. Okay, now we move to systems with changing mass. Remember initially in the first slides I said we could use this f equals ma only if mass was constant but what happens if mass is changing for example as happens in this rocket where it uses its fuel and the fuel is going down so it's basically decreasing so the mass the total mass is decreasing so in this case i cannot use f equals ma but i can use f equals delta p divided by delta t and delta p is m v delta t so now m is also changing so this change delta change it also acts on m not only v so let's start with propellers uh, these are propellers for example for uh, for a ship or for a plane propellers push the water in the case of ship or or air in the case of the plane backwards so that the ship or airplane is propelled forward so they're pushing the water or the air in the back direction so that the uh, so that the, uh, the ship or the plane can go forward but without a medium such as water or air propellers won't work so if you are in the sky where there is no air the propellers will not work because there's really no air or water or any medium to push against. Then this question comes to mind, but how do space rockets work in outer space where there's no air to push against? The answer is they push against their own fuel that comes out burned from their engine at their back. So the underlying physics is again, momentum conservation. So even though there's no air here in, you know, outside the atmosphere, so in the outer sky, outer space, they can push against their own fuel, which is burned, so that they can propel forward. Okay, let's, Analyze how rocket propulsion happens. Again, imagine there's no air here, no air. You don't need air for rocket propulsion. So imagine initially there's no speed. And when the fuel is burned, what happens? The fuel comes out in the negative direction. Okay, so let's say the fuel comes out with V fuel, some speed and it has some mass so the fuel that comes out from the rocket it has some momentum now if initial momentum is zero then the final total momentum should be zero how is it possible it's only possible that the rocket is gaining momentum in the forward direction so that's the idea behind rocket propulsion. So the change in change of momentum of the rocket, in, remember initially it was zero, 
finally it has some momentum, it's equal to change in the momentum of the fuel. And if you divide both sides with delta t, which you know, if you remember the Newton's second law, then this becomes Newton's second law. So this is this part, we are gonna call it force on the rocket. So the force on the rocket that's coming from, that's, uh, that's the force. So whatever that force is pushing this rocket, well, that force is actually coming from the fuel. So that force, it's also called a thrust. You can think of this as like pushing. It will be equal to P fuel is again M fuel times V fuel. Now, if we assume V fuel is time independent, which means constant, if V fuel is not changing, then I can take V fuel outside the change sign, which is delta. So what's left is delta M divided by delta T times V fuel. So that thrust, thrust force, which is like push, you can understand as a push, it depends on V fuel, the speed of the fuel that's coming from, uh, from the back of the rocket, times the change in mass. So the force is more when the, the change in mass is more. What is change in mass? Well, change in mass is how can you change, how can you increase the change in mass per time? Well, if you burn more fuel, so delta M divided by delta T, change in mass per time. Remember, this is fuel. If you burn more fuel, what will happen? This change will be more. If that change is more, then the thrust force is more, which makes sense. Okay, in this exercise, this is just like the rocket, but in this case, we have a wagon, we have a kid in the wagon, and the kid is throwing rocks in the opposite direction so that it can be propelled in the forward direction. So a child sits in a wagon with a pile of 0 0.65 kilogram rocks. So there are rocks, each has this much mass. The child can throw each rock with a speed 11 meter per second. Okay, that's the speed of the uh, rocks relative to the ground, causing the wagon to move. How many rocks must the child throw per minute to maintain a constant speed against a 3.4 Newton force of friction? So the wagon has some friction, so let's show it in the opposite direction, F, F friction. So this is friction. The only way that the kid and the wagon move forward with let's say speed V wagon, with constant speed, the only way for that is to have some force, force of thrust in the positive direction. When force of thrust and the friction force, when they're equal, then in that case, the kid or the wagon, it can maintain constant speed. Remember in that if they're equal, then we would get F net equals zero. So remember we had M times A, so acceleration will be zero. And that happens when F thrust minus friction force equal to zero, which means F thrust equals the friction force. So we are going to equate them. First, write down F thrust. So if you remember from the previous slide, it was M fuel, change in, change in, in the mass of the fuel. It's, you can think of this as how much mass is burned and divide by delta T, 
how much mass is burned per second times V fuel. In this case, the fuel is the rock. So there's, it's not really uh, gas or oil so, or uh, jet fuel. It's, it's rock in this case. So how many rocks is thrown? So let's see. So this is the mass of the rocks thrown. If it, you know, this is the mass of only one rock. If he, the kid throws n stones, it will be the, to, the change in mass will be n times mass. We don't know how many n, how many, um, how many rocks he's throwing, but we will find that n. So now here, this is the friction force. And this part is the F thrust. And here V fuel will be the speed of these rocks. And according to the problem, the speed of the rocks is 11 meter per second. So this is V fuel. Okay, now I'm going to equate F thrust to the friction force. Remember, if that happens, in that case, the acceleration is zero. So the wagon would move with constant speed. So 3.4 is the friction force. And change in M fuel would be the number of stones thrown in one minute. Here it says the child throw, how many, how many rocks must the child throw per minute? So one minute, converted to seconds, so it makes 60 seconds. And we want the wagon to maintain a constant speed. Sorry, uh, we have to multiply by the speed of each rock, which is given as 11 meter per second. Now we have everything except n stones. And if you calculate, if you solve for n stones, you find it to be 29. So that means if the kid throws 29 stones per minute, so it approximately makes one stone in every two seconds. If the kid does that, then the wagon and the kid, they can maintain a constant speed in the forward direction. Okay, what about the helicopter? Helicopter thrust, we're going to talk about it now. The thrust force on the helicopter, let's call this F thrust. Now think about this helicopter, it's, it's uh, flying or it's stationary in the air. We know that it has weight, so for the helicopter to be able to st stay like this, should be some force in the up direction to balance it. Now that's the uh, thrust force. It's upward and it's due to the air pu pushed downward by the blades. The blades of the helicopter, they are pushing air all the time in the down direction. So here M fuel and V fuel are the mass of the air pushed down and the speed of the air. So the helicopter is not really pushing any, it's not like a rocket, it's actually using the air as fuel. So it's pushing the air down and from that it gets some thrust force. So here, this is for air and this is also for air. In the previous example, M fuel, the mass of the fuel, was the mass of the stones thrown by the kid. In this case, it's the mass of the air. And in the cases, if you remember, in the case of a rocket, it was the mass of the fuel. It was the mass of the fuel burned.
Let's move to center of mass. Center of mass, we can, we are going to abbreviate it as CM, or it's also called center of gravity, same thing. Uh, the center of mass of a system is the point where the system can be hung so that it will be balanced. So in, if you have a heavier mass and lighter mass, the center of mass will be close to the heavier one. If the masses are the same, then it will be in the middle. For a book, it will be somewhere in the book, in the middle, or for a bowling ball, it will be again in the middle. For life boy, it's going to be in the middle somewhere like this. So these are the center of mass points. For a human body, it's somewhere around the belly. The center of mass is somewhere around the belly. So how do you calculate the position of the center of mass? Well, we have two formulas for them. The position, remember these are positions in the x direction and in the y direction, they are given by these formulas. If you compare these, the only difference is x positions and y positions. So in the numerator, you multiply each piece of mass by their x coordinates and divide by, divided by the, by the total mass. For the y coordinate, the cm means center of mass not centimeters, so center of mass. In the y case, you are multiplying each mass by the y coordinates and again divide by the total mass. So let's say we have this system, these three masses. So the, y co the, the coordinate system, you choose it, right? You put it anywhere. So you can put it like this if you want or you can put it like this, it's up to you. So in this case here, I put it like this. This is the origin. Now I'm going to write the coordinates of these masses. So for this one, the coordinate, the X coordinate is 0 0.12 and the Y coordinate is zero. So the first thing that I write is X. The second thing that I write is the Y coordinate. For this one, the x coordinate is 0 0.4 and the y coordinate is 0 because it's on the x axis. And finally, for this mass, the x coordinate is 0 and the y coordinate is 0 0.18. Okay, let's calculate the center of mass. It will be somewhere here. What are the coordinates? What are the x coordinate and the y coordinate? for the center of mass. So this point is x center of mass, and this point is y center of mass. Okay, let's just calculate the x coordinate of the center of mass. So I start with this mass. So I write its mass 2.5, and I write its x coordinate. Now, if you look at here, its x coordinate is zero. Now for this mass, I write mass again, 1.6, and its x coordinate is 0 0.12. And for the last one, its mass is 0 0.64, and x coordinate is 0 0.4. Now in the denominator, you have to write all the masses. Okay, do not make the mistake of not writing 2.5 because we multiply it by zero here, no. In the denominator, you have to write all the masses, even if their coordinate is zero. Even if you have, a co like, let's say, mass here, its coordinates are zero, zero. But even for that, you have, in the denominator, you have to write its mass as well. And this calculation gives 0 0.095 meters. So it's somewhere here. So that number here. And for y, you will do the same calculation, but in this case, we will write the y components, 0 0.18 and 0, 0, 004, these two. They don't have y components, so that's why we get zeros from here. But again, in the denominator, you write all the masses. Turns out this has the same number. And they are the same number, but it's just a coincidence. It's, there's no meaning for that. Just a coincidence in this problem. 
Now, what happens if you have extended objects, not like point objects, not like point-like objects, but what happens in extended objects like an arm or a hand? So we can, uh, so they can be considered as separate point-like particles where the mass is concentrated at the center of mass location at, of each part. So you can think of this upper arm. Let's say its center of mass is given at this point. So instead of the upper arm, I'm gonna actually use just this point if its center of mass is point, if its center of mass of the whole upper arm is here, then I will now forget about the upper arm. I will just consider this point. If the forearm, it has center of mass somewhere here, then I will use it as a point object. And if the hand has a center of mass here, then I will use this point. So what happens is even though these are extended objects, if I know their center of mass, individual center of mass points, then the problem becomes just like this problem. So they are actually the same problem. And so you find the same numbers as a result. So the center of mass point of the whole object is again the same point. Now, if you have such an object, let's say if you leave this object, what will happen? It will tip over like this. Why is this happening? Now, let's talk about this concept, the points of support. This object is getting support from all the points here, 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 but the, the, the rightmost and the leftmost points, they're called points of support. So if so the upper part, it has center of mass here. The lower part, it has center of mass here. The center of mass of the whole object will be somewhere in between, somewhere in between on this line. So for this problem, for this figure, it's given here. So the weight is here. So there's a force in this direction. Now look at the points of support. The weight is outside, not in between but outside the points of support. So that will lead to tipping over. So this object will tip over like this. Objects tip over since the center of mass falls. The center of mass is falling. See, it was here, now it's down here. That's the reason of tipping over, it's gravity. Tip over happens if the center of mass is outside the left, or right points of support. So left point of support, right point of support. As you can see, the weight is outside, so it will tip over. Now look at this figure here. The center of mass is given here. Now look at the points of support. This one and this one. The center of mass is in between these points of support, so this will not tip over. Now look at this human. Okay, if you bend like this, your back goes a little bit, your bottom goes a little bit to the back so that this center of mass point, your center of mass point goes in between the points of support. So if you're, if you're like this, because your center of mass is in between your toe and the heel, you will not tip over, you will not fall. But you can try one thing, let's say, now you can pause the video and try this. Let's say there's a wall and put your heel, so this is your leg like this, this is your foot, and this is your heel right on the wall. And this is your foot, okay, this is the ground. Now try to, bend like this and see what happens. So you can pause the video here and come back. Now, if you tried, you have, ex you, 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 I'm sure you fell. The reason is that if you are here, if there's a wall, you cannot push your bottom to the back. So you will be more like your bottom 
your back will be more like this and you will be more like this your head will be here and if you are like this what happens is your center of mass becomes somewhere here maybe so it's it's outside these points of support this is the weight and that's the reason that you fall but of course if there's no wall you can do this and you will not tip over okay in this exercise the question is how much the potential energy decreases after the tip over so initially the object is held like this and then you release it and it tips over on the ground so basically this this point comes to the ground the answer is after tipping over the change in potential energy of the object is basically it will be this change right so let's say initially this point is zero potential energy initial uh, no this is final and this is let's say initial if this point if you take this point this level to be zero this is going to be mg h this is initial so the change in potential energy will be u final minus u initial what is the final zero what is the initial mgh so as you can see the change is negative mgh so negative change means the potential energy decreased by mgh and as you can see i calculated the potential energy of this extended object with respect to its center of mass points so when you have an extended object like this you can calculate its potential energy with respect to the center of mass point so you can have also setups like these so there's this disk and there's this extra weight attached so there's this extra weight now the disk has some center so if you have only only just the yellow disk it has center of mass in the middle right right at the center point so its center of mass will be here but if you had add another disk here extra weight now this disk has center of mass at the middle now you have so let's do it this way so the larger disk has center of mass at the center of the disk the small the purple one has center of mass at the center now the total center of mass will be in between somewhere in between here it's shown as this point now because this point is to the right of the center so what where is the where is the point of contact or point of support it's for this for the disk there's only one we don't have two remember if you had an object like this we had two support points and if the center of mass fell between these points we would say it would not tip over but in this case in the case of the disk there's only one point of support so center of mass is outside the point of support so this will turn to the right so but if you have a setup like this so it will turn until it moves to this position so if you're in this position now you, you can see that this is the point of support and the center of mass of the, the whole object is here it passes through that support point in this case there will be no motion of course if you start with this setup it will rock back and forth so it will do the oscillation but if there is friction on the ground after some point after some time it will ultimately find this equilibrium position so center of mass wants to fall just like any other object 
And I'm sure you have seen these balancing forks or the balancing birds. Uh, this is also related to center of mass. So um, all of us, we were amazed by this when we were kids. And in fact, I'm still amazed by this, but it's, you can explain this, why this is not tipping over or falling down in this direction. The reason is there's actually heavy mass here and heavy mass here. So it's produced in a way that carefully calculated in a way that the center of mass falls exactly this point. So because center of mass is at this point, it would not actually tip over. Same thing with the forks. If you think about it's their extended objects, maybe the center of mass of this one is here and the center of mass of this one is here. So when the total center of mass, maybe it's here, when it corresponds to the point where the, uh, it, it, with, with this point, with this, uh, the point where the glass and the toothpick is in contact, which is here. When the center of mass corresponds to this point, then you get the balance in this, in this setup. So again, these examples are related to center of mass. Okay, so now in this exercise, it says, find the horizontal position of the center of mass. Let's say this is in balance. So we will find the center of mass. Where is it? What is the coordinate of the center of mass with respect to this given coordinate system? Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, so these are extended objects, but I can take their center, their mass as concentrated at the center of mass point. So for each one, it's gonna be, it's gonna be in the middle. I assume they're homogeneous. So these are center of mass of each individual brick. Now let's start with the first one. The center of mass of the, uh, the coordinate of the first one is now the whole thing is L. So this distance becomes L divided by two. So with respect to this coordinate system, the coordinate of the first brick is L divided by two and its mass is M. Now, what about the coordinate of the two? The second uh, brick, it's X coordinate. The, set, the X coordinate of the center of mass is, if you look at it here, it's actually L. This distance is actually the distance of the, the length of the brick which is L, now I multiply it by M in the numerator, but in the denominator, I just put their masses. Now finally, what is the, what is the center of mass point? What is the coordinate of the center of mass of this final brick? So now if you look at the figure, so this part is L divided by two, so from here, to here, it's L divided by two. And here it's given in the problem as L divided by four. So this part is from here to here, it's L divided by four. And from here to here, it's L divided by two. So this, this distance is L divided by two. So we have to add all of these, L divided by two, L divided by four, L divided by two. These two makes L. So L plus L divided by four, it becomes five L divided by four. So the coordinate, this coordinate, X coordinate of this point is five L divided by four. Now this calculation gives the coordinate of the center of mass is as 11 divided by 12 L. Now where's that point? If you look at this number, this number is not, it's, it's smaller than L, right? If it was L, we would say the 
center of mass of this whole system would be somewhere on this line. It will be here if it was L, but it's smaller than L. So it's more like, like this point. So the center of mass of the whole, whole setup is at this point. Now here, the blocks will remain in balance as the center of mass is not horizontally out of the two points of support. What are the points of support here? It's here, the left one, and the right one is here. If the center of mass point is not exactly L, which is this point, but less than it, it's somewhere here, and you can see that it falls in between the support points, so we can say it will be in balance. So this will not collapse or tip over. So it will be in balance. There is this concept, uh, overhang distance D. Uh, it's the distance from this point. In this case, let's say you put several bricks on top of each other and uh, the overhang distance is defined as from this point to this point, the tip of the, 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 the last brick or any object. So now this D, it can be arbitrarily large by using more and more blocks. So you can use, if you want, uh, you can make this one meter. You can make it five meters and there is a way if you put them, you know, if you calculate where each block or the object should be put. So if, you, if the final, if the center of mass of the final setup is somewhere, if it doesn't pass this point, so let's say if it's somewhere behind this line, as we calculated in the previous problem, let's say somewhere here, it will not tip over. But it's interesting that you can arbitrarily make this D large by adding more and more blocks, given that you always calculate carefully, you add the blocks carefully, so that the center of mass is always behind this line. In fact, this has been tested on one of these episodes of uh, Mythbusters. You can watch it online, it's, uh, it's, it's on YouTube, The Leaning Tower of Liar. And they made this, uh, and so they're basically adding some wood planks, so like really thin, on top of each other, and it stays in balance. Now we can talk about the motion of center of mass. Object may rotate or disintegrate into pieces as in the case of fireworks, but the center of mass travels as if all the mass is concentrated at the point. At the center of mass point. So you can think of this hammer, it's thrown now it makes really complicated motion. It's 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 thrown. It's moving up and down, and then it's also rotating. But if you look at the center of the motion of the center of mass, its its center of mass is close to this iron part. The center of mass is actually following the projectile motion. Remember, if you throw any object, like a point-like object it will follow a parabolic curve. We call this projectile motion. So that trajectory, if you look at the trajectory, this object, the center of mass is, even though it also rotates during the motion, but the center of mass, the motion of the center of mass is projectile motion. As if this object, everything, all the mass is concentrated at, at the same point. And the same thing happens with the fireworks. You throw the fireworks, it, you fire it, it goes up. So 
this is its trajectory, its projectile motion, it's a parabola. So at some point, the fireworks disintegrates into many pieces. Pieces. So look at the pieces here. Look at the pieces here. But if you find the center of mass of these pieces at any point, that center of mass will fall on that trajectory, on that parabola. So that's the meaning of the sentence. If the center of mass is, if it was initially stationary, which means not moving like this, like this bump here, so before the explosion, it will stay so the center of mass will will be you know, after the explosion this, even though these fragments are moving in opposite directions but if you calculate so you know the masses at any point you will know their coordinates because you know you know if you multiply time with these velocities you know you will know their positions if you calculate the center of mass you will find the center of mass to be at the same point all the times. If the center of mass was initially moving on a path, as we talked about here with the fireworks, it will continue moving on that path even though the object may rotate or explode. So here is the example of rotation with the hammer and with the fireworks, it's the example of explosion. But as I said, at any point, if you calculate the center of mass, it will fall on this parabola because it's making the center of mass itself is making projectile motion. Okay, that's end of this video. So I'll see you in the next lecture.